First, I would like to give all honor, praises, and thanks to the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and benevolent God, which has blessed us in this dispensation of time by bringing us back from the land of the captivity and allowing us to tread upon that great and holy land of ours. I greet you in peace. I would like to express my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to the Honorable Minister Farrakhan for this invitation to come into this holy habitation and to share these moments with you. I am thankful and I'm grateful. I want to also mention, I was listening to the Honorable Minister Farrakhan give the date of November 1977 when he stood to affirm that he was going to move for the rebirth of the nation of Islam. It was in October of 1977 that the kingdom of God was hurled in its glory. The new birth of the redemptive struggle in the Holy Land was in October of 1977. That's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was making a similar stand here in this land of the captivity in November of 1977. I've chosen to speak unto you today about spirituality and destiny. Brothers and sisters, wherever we are on this planet as a people today, we're losing. We're losing in the Caribbean. We're losing in South America. We're losing in Africa. We're losing in America. And except that we show some resistance as a people and halt this onslaught against our people, you can rest assured that from the losses that we are accumulating, the final decisions will be taken for our annihilation off of this planet. You're right. I'm trying to scare you. But it says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So I want you to understand that someone has made you very comfortable in the midst of all of this. And I'm not an entertainer. I'm not here to make you comfortable. I'm here to arouse you and to arouse your concern to what is taking place around you. Because you see, you have to understand that it is a different view that you get when you're up on the watchtower and when you're opening the front door down on the first floor. You see, you open the door on the first floor and you look out and you don't see nothing. But we're up on the watchtower and we see a long ways away. So you have to listen to those that can see a little bit further than what you see at the front door. So, we see these things closing in on us as a people. And I'm concerned because you're too comfortable. I'm concerned because you're not showing any resistance to what is taking place. So I'm going to touch upon spirituality and destiny and a little bit about laws of relativity. Laws of relativity are unseen laws that are out there. They're not written anywhere, but they govern the lives of men and women. One of those laws was referred to by Jesus when he said, where a man stores his treasures, there will his heart be also. 
Now, what did he mean by that? Because the adversary is very, very cunning. He said, where a man stores his treasures, there will his heart be also. That means that wherever you can attain the things that you treasure, there will your heart be. So you see, the adversary then knows that you can only speak the things that are in your heart because it's a relative law that governs the things that you can speak. So now the problem is that you have been taught to now treasure all of these things in this society. This is where your heart is because you treasure your automobiles. You treasure your homes. You not understanding that once you treasure these things, you would like to speak on behalf of God, but there's a relative law that won't allow you because you can only speak according to what is in your heart. Because there are relative laws that govern everything that you and I can speak. And where a man finds the things that he treasures, there is his heart also. So the adversary does not stop until he causes you to treasure the things that he has placed before you here. Knowing that once you begin to treasure these things, you have to speak on his behalf. And that means that he has tricked you once again. You see, an individual that does not know when they are winning, they don't know when they're losing. See, it is a relative law that governs that. An individual that does not know when he is living, does not know when he is dying. And it is for that reason that our people are continuously tricked. Because I hear them say every day, all day, that it's all a part of life. Dying is all a part of life. Now, I never read anywhere where dying had anything to do with living. Dying is a complete opposite of living. I have yet to hear anyone to tell our people or to guide our people to engage death. Death is defeatable. But if you don't understand that death is defeatable, you won't challenge death. Death came into existence through deception. Sickness came into existence through deception. And I want to begin there in the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 9 and 10. I want you to reflect back to the days of Noah. And I want to arouse you just a little bit. Noah preached during the end of the world. You see, for 40 years, Noah preached, and he didn't get one convert, a very evil generation, to say the least. Not one convert. 40 years he preached. And no one believed Noah when he was telling him that it was all over. And then the rains came. And the rains came and our people were tricked again because they thought that the rains determined the end of the world. But the rains came after the end of the world. Now follow along with me and listen carefully. Because you've got to understand why I've got to make you very uncomfortable. The adversary has made you very comfortable in sin. I want to make you very uncomfortable in sin and uncomfortable in hell. And until you get uncomfortable in hell, you won't put up that all-out fight to get to heaven. You are too comfortable in hell. So now, Noah preached. But what was the end of the world? I said that to say that the rains were the end of the world, that's a euphemism. The rains came after it was all over. Noah preached during the end of the world. The end of the world was determined by an equation. By an equation, the people's relationship with God, the environment, social corruption, 
and a continuous imagination to create evil. This equated the end. And when the rains came, it was after. Now that means that sometime prior to the coming of the rains was the end of the world. You don't really think that the rains determined the end of the world. It was the evil of the people prior to that that determined the end of the world. And the rains came merely to wash it all away. But the end of the world had already come. You've got to understand. Because Jesus said, so shall it be as in the days of Noah. Apathy toward the Word of God. No consciousness as to what's taking place around them. Waiting for the rains to come and not understanding that when Noah preached, it was already during the end of the world. An equation. That same equation is in existence today. Consider the people's relationship with God all over the planet. Consider the environment. The earth is an endangered species. Look at the social corruption and the continuous imagination to invent and create evil. That equals the end. There is nothing else that this world has to do to determine the end. It is simply now the masters must reach in and preach as Noah preached. This world is over. This is after the end of this world. There is nothing else that this world has to do. It is something that the men of God must do now, as Noah had to do. That is to make the people aware that this world is all over. And until you understand that, there is nothing else. What other evil are you looking for them to do? They did sufficient evil a thousand times over. Now the men of God, as Noah had to do during the end times, we must make you aware to come out. There is nothing else to pursue in this world. This world is of the past now. All of this is over. But deception, you're looking to see this in the Chicago Sun Times and the Tribune. You want to hear this from every source except men of God. But it's not going to come any other way. This is the way the message is going to come. You're going to believe those sent by God or perish reading the Sun Times and the Tribune. Brothers and sisters, think for a moment. The rains, what did the rains have to do with the end of the world? It was the foolishness of the people that had determined the end of the world. The rains came after the end of the world. So, then you're probably going to say now, all of these people in the world, God's going to destroy this. Let us go back to the days of Noah. There was a social system in existence. When Noah preached, you don't think that there were men, women, children, expecting women, expecting sisters, little bitty babies. There was a world then. And when Noah entered that ark, when Noah entered that ark, the people had never saw rain coming from the heavens. The rains used to come up as a mist from the earth. They had never seen rain fall from the heavens. They didn't believe Noah. Why? Because they had been taught that that's not practical. That's what makes everybody so comfortable. Because your fear of God is gone. So now, 
Noah preached. Then he entered into the ark. And when he entered into the ark, it was all over. Now let us consider. All of those people that had rebelled against old man Noah. First day, the rains begin to fall. A few of them ask, you seen Noah today? Noah was on the ark though, you know, but when that rain began to fall, a few of them inquired, where is old man Noah? Couple of days of rain and they, where does Noah live? Just wanted to see his face again. And them, them waters got up above their ankles and going up to their knees. Some of them were ready to repent. They were ready to change with all seriousness. Waters got up above their knees. And they went knocking on the door of the ark. But you heard those songs that says, God got the key and you can't get in. You see, there are seasons for repentance. You see, you're too comfortable. You've laid out your plan of repentance. You've got your schedule when you're going to start serving God. But it's not you that determines that. You see, Noah, when he left there that last evening, it was just like he had left every other day. Nothing special. He said goodbye and left them that evening. Nobody knew that. That was the last day. He wouldn't be back no more. That was no farewell party. The messengers that have been sent unto you, one day, just like Noah, you're going to come looking for them, and they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone. Once Noah went into the ark and sealed the ark, that water got up above their knees. They were crying. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Saying all the right things. You know what they were saying. They were saying all of the right things. I got, I got a three-year-old son. Lord, you wouldn't do that. And my daughter is just a little nursing baby. Father, be merciful. You wouldn't do that. But you got to understand now, when that season ended, it was a world just like this world. They were expecting women, little bitty babies, big babies. It was all over. It had been preached. And it was too late. When they looked for the messenger then, he had come, preached, and gone. What did Jesus say? He would come as a thief in the night. And the thief in the night is most effective when you're out at the football game, sleeping, or some frame of unconsciousness. That's what the thief prefers. He get in, take care of his work, and get out before you know what has happened. So, Jesus said it would be just like in the days of Noah. So would it be in the coming of the anointed messengers in this day. Said they would be marrying and giving in marriage. Building and tearing down. Apathetic. Going on about business as usual. The same as they were then. They've got their own plan. Well, I'm going to change next year. Give me another seven months. But all of you sitting out here, you are in your own personal time frame. Every day that you are on the path away from God, that's like a little ratchet wrench. And each day it gets wider and wider and wider. And at some point, the gulf is too wide. You can't bridge it. What day is that? I can't tell you. But I can tell you this. You don't know it. I don't know it. But every day that you don't hold and turn around may be the last day. The gulf will get too wide and you can't cross over. I recall Lazarus and the rich man. When everything was transformed and Lazarus was being blessed and the rich man was being cursed. And then the rich man said, Yet if I could just have Lazarus to dip his finger into a bowl of water and let a few drops drop on me. The rich man had come to the realization that he was in hell. But Lazarus told him, he said, the gulf 
is too wide. He said, I can't get to you, and you can't get to me. The goat have gotten too wide, and each one of you out here have your own personal goat. And every day that you are alienated from God, it gets wider and wider and wider. Tomorrow may be your last rat on the ratchet wrench. Tomorrow your gulf may be too wide. We can't get to you, and you can't get to us. But I'm trying to make you very uncomfortable because you need to change now. You need to repent today. You need to change now. And but just like Noah, brothers and sisters, you got to understand there was a social system in the days of Noah. But no one was saved but Noah and his sons and their wives. Eight souls are evil generation. But nevertheless, just like he told them, hey, all of that generation perished because they didn't listen. And the rains came and washed it all away. The book of Revelation, the 12th chapter, verses 9 and 10. The problem. Read in the hearing of the audience, please. Reading from the book of Revelations, the 12th chapter, 9th verse. And it reads on this wise. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, who deceiveth the whole world. Wait a minute. He deceiveth what? He deceiveth the whole world. How do you deceive the whole world? It says that the devil has deceived the whole world. Now that's got to be a master of deception. <laughs> An entire world is rotating on the axis of a line. An entire world is rotating on the axis of a line. Deception is to cause to accept what is false and invalid to be true and valid. Let me say it again. Deception is to cause to accept what is false and invalid to be true and valid. That means, if I may paraphrase, the devil has caused the whole world to accept what is false and invalid to be true and valid. And the opposite of that, he has caused them to accept what is true and valid to be false and invalid. Now my, 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 it take a God to get you out of that maze. <laughs> Deception to cause to accept what is a lie and invalid to be true and valid. He has deceived the whole world. Now, how do you deceive the whole world except that evil lying has been institutionalized? How do you deceive the whole world except that there are governments? who sit on the throne of lies. How do you deceive the whole world? Except that you have some Stanfords and some Yales and some Harvards and some Michigan States. How do you deceive the whole world? But the devil has deceived the whole world. Let's get putting it close to home, ain't it? <laughs> because now, that means that you got to leave out of here and be certain of what world you in. Because if you're not in this world, it's talking about you. You see, there are only two forces locked in battle on this planet. I want to pull up purgatory from under you. You've had too many waiting places. You see, the... <laughs> You know, the Catholics gave you a purgatory. They promised you that you could do all the wickedness on the planet and go to some place in between heaven and hell and wait and pay your way out of it and then journey on. Well, well I'm going to pull a purgatory from under you today. 
Now, here is the adversary that is a master of deception. A master of deception. He has told you that he gave you a diploma and told you you attained high education. He deceived you. Now, you, of course, you don't, when you get your PhD and all that, you don't want nobody to tell you that you've been tricked. <laughs> Why? Because it is utterly impossible to attain higher education if God is not the central figure of that education. <laughs> Who told you that you could attain higher education without God? Utterly impossible. He trained you to fit a slot to support his economy. He did not dedicate you. And all of you with your degrees, you fit into a slot and you support his economy. That's all you know how to do. He tricked you. I know you're wondering now, you say, well, he's just saying that because he don't have no diploma. <laughs> you know I know what's going through your mind. <laughs> uh, well, I'm just going by your word. That means that I haven't been tricked. Oh, <laughs> uh, maybe not there. Okay. Higher education. First of all, has to teach you your relationship and your place in the plan of God. That's how higher education begins. To teach you your place in the plan and the will of God. Higher education will teach you how to walk, how to talk, how to dress, how to eat, how to relate to your woman, your man, your children. Look out in the streets today and tell me where are your high educated African Americans? The man is gone. The woman is gone. The children are gone. The neighborhood is gone. And you walking around talking about you got a higher education. Everything in our race is gone. And you present me your diploma. Says, Jesus said, by the fruit you would know them. Higher education. Let me explain that to you. But you understand. A heart surgeon that can perform a triple bypass operation, you know, a surgeon that can perform a heart transplant, he's a sur surgical genius. He's a surgical genius. But now, the institution that trained him has trained a surgical genius to be able to perform a heart transplant. But which institution is the greatest? The institution that trained him to perform a heart transplant or the institution that trained you how to keep your heart? Which is the greatest institution? Isn't the greatest institution the institution that trained you how to keep your heart? Is that the greatest institution? Let us consider. Now I said that to perform a heart transplant, he's a surgical genius. Then what do we call those that teach you how to keep your heart and not need a heart transplant? High, which is higher education? Which of those institutions Instructors should receive the highest salary. 
Which one would you prefer to attend? So that you can understand the institution whose instructors can teach you how to keep your heart, they ought to have the pay increase. They are the greatest instructors. Now, and we go further. They perform brain surgery. Brain surgery can perform brain surgery. You've got to be a surgical genius. But brothers and sisters, let me tell you, there are no greater brain surgeons than men of God. The greatest brain surgeons are men of God. No greater brain surgeons than men of God. Then what do you call them that cannot even need a laser and that can go in and take out and put a whole new brain in while you standing there not sedated before them? Which is the greatest institution? to be reborn again. You've got to be taught how to find those that have high dedication. Because in former times, it wasn't called education, it was called dedication. Because you started on the path of dedicating your lives unto God. And it was high dedication. Do you know any greater brain surgeons than men of God. They don't need no lasers. Hey, they can transform, they can go in there and pull out that old piece of rubber, grab that sponge out of there and cast it aside hey, and put a whole new brain up there in your mind. Now, if I said that the brain surgeon is a surgical genius, then I, there are no words to explain what men of God are and the institutions that train them. That's high dedication. But because you don't understand, you go to the laser beam brain surgeons. And when they get through with you, they tell you you're going to be crippled for life. <laughs> they tell you that, well, you may get another year. And here we tell you that, come by here. We'll give you a whole new brain. Won't be nothing wrong with you. And you'll live forever. And you still go, oh, that says something is wrong with you. Something that you don't understand. Seems like you all ought to be standing out in front of the minister's office day and night. Telling him, I heard that you... Well, a master brain surgeon. Put it to the test. No greater brain surgeons than men of God. And then certainly we know if they've worked on y'all's brains, I mean, we know that they're well qualified if they've... And well qualified if he's been out here in the midst of African Americans and working on their brains because theirs don't come out so easy. I mean, you got to tug with it. And so... You don't understand about deception. You've been trained, trained to support an economy. But in former times, the child began at an early age the pathway of dedication because his entire life he was being guided as to how he should be dedicated unto God. That's what the whole what is it that you're teaching children? Reading, writing, and arithmetic, fine. But you're teaching them how to apply these things within this creative process. Now they've taken that away from you and given you a paycheck and told you that you've been high, you have attained higher education. Look at how you govern your neighborhoods. Look at how you govern your families. They've tricked you. It says, and he has deceived the whole world. 
The whole world has been deceived. Deception. He told you that he invited all of our people into hell and convinced them that it was heaven. All of this hell all around you, all day, every day, and you ain't been just catching it for this year, you've been catching it ever since you've been here. And you say, oh, the best thing that ever happened to black people. <laughs> To cause, to accept what is false and invalid, to be true and valid. Deception. Now, he took your woman, he took the man, took the woman and told her he didn't like the way that she looked. And he tells her, I want to make you up. So he made her go out and... She put on all the makeup because, you see, once he tricked you, he has to cause you to identify with him. The devil has to cause you to identify with him. All of the world today, all of the world today identifies with whatever the trends are that come out of you. So then he told the sisters that well, you need to be made up. I don't like you looking that way. God gave her a natural look, and somebody didn't like now, God made you, and you were pleasing in his eyes, and here comes somebody else and say that you need makeup. You need to be made up. Made up to please who? Who is it that you need to be made up to please? Deception. And then once she was made up, he told her that you sure look good now. Deception. To cause, to accept a lie. Now, Find me a man of God. Find one man of God that considers a sister with the lipstick slapped on, the rosy cheeks, the eyelashes and the eyelids. Find one man of God that will tell her that she's fine. Find one man of God that will tell her that when she is made up, well, I don't know, she may be fine, but I can't tell. I can't see her. Where is she at? Deception. Deception. Every, all of them want to look like Helene Curtis now. All oh, that's deception. To cause, to accept the lie. And then Jesus said, ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall what? set you free. I'm trying to set you free. And the truth shall set you free. So that means that truth then becomes a weapon. How many individuals have told you that truth then is a weapon to undermine the lie? Truth. Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. What is true? Well, if truth is needed to set you free, somebody's got to know truth. Other than that, you won't ever get free. Someone has to know truth. Then next, if someone has to know truth, truth has to be, when heard, comprehensible. Other than that, you still could never get free. Someone has to know truth, and that truth has to be comprehensible when it is spoken. Because it is the truth that has to become the weapon to undermine the lie that is holding you in this captivity. Truth. Someone has to know who you are. Truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What is truth? Well, if truth is needed to set you free, somebody's got to know truth. Other than that, you won't ever get free. Someone has to know truth. Then next, if someone has to know truth, 
Truth has to be, when heard, comprehensible. Other than that, you still could never get free. Someone has to know truth, and that truth has to be comprehensible when it is spoken. Because it is the truth that has to become the weapon to undermine the lie that is holding you in this captivity. Truth. Someone has to know who you are. No, no. Utterly impossible that don't nobody know who the African American is. No, no. Someone has to know who you are. First of all, wherever your history is, it has got to be an outstanding history. Because no one else has a history like you. Whenever you read about yourself, you're going to know it's you because no other history is like your history. No other people are like you. Somebody know who you are. Deception. He has deceived the whole world. Continue on, please. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So the devil was cast down. This war that we're reading about was a mental war. Heaven, a high elevated place. A high elevated place. The high elevated place of your existence is your mind. Your mind. A war in heaven, a war in the high elevated place of you. And they were fighting for possession of your mind. That's what we're doing here now, fighting for possession of our people's mind. <laughs> Trying to cause you brothers and you sisters to cast down deception. And what happened after deception was cast down? Mm -hmm. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. Now, once the devil was cast down. The devil is what? Deception. Once deception was cast down, said he heard a loud voice saying in heaven. And what did it say? Uh huh. Now is come salvation. Wait and a minute. Now is come what? Salvation. Redemption came after deception was cast down. What is it that is preventing the redemption of our people? They have been imprisoned by a lie. Once that lie is cast down, redemption comes. Salvation came after deception was cast down. What else came? And strength. And what? And strength. Deception weakens. Deception weakens our people. The lie weakens you. Once the lie was cast down, it says, and then came strength. We need strength. But you've been seeking strength everywhere except in the truth. You've been trying to find strength in your professions, in economics, in politics. You've been trying to find strength. But I'm telling you that your weakness is caused by deception. And once deception is cast down, strength will come in the midst of our people. All of those. The only individuals feared by the Euro Gentile on this planet are those that he can't deceive. Let me say it again. Now you check this out. The only individuals feared on this planet by the Euro Gentiles are those that he cannot deceive. When he can't deceive you, he gets afraid of you. He becomes afraid of you. Because what? He sees strength. Strength. But you think he cares what's taking place down in the hood? Make him no difference? Because he sees weakness in the hood. Will make him no difference. But one man of God, brethren, you've forgotten, sisters. It's been a long time 
you've got to understand that when one, one prophet, one man of God, when it would just be rumored he hadn't got to the city yet, when it would just be rumored that he was on his way, all the city would fear. One man of God, one prophet, when the people heard that one man of God was on his way to the city, all of them began to tremble. You've long forgotten how men of God make people feel. Everybody gets shook up in the presence of men of God. Strength. When Samuel was on his way to Bethlehem, and all the elders, they inquired, Samuel's coming. Samuel's coming. And they said, we pray that he's coming in peace. We pray that one man on a donkey, no weapon. You've forgotten the power of men of God. We're going to remind you again, though. The only people feared by the Euro Gentiles are those that he cannot and has not deceived. Then, when he finds one of those, he mobilizes all of his armies and he points him out. Get him! <laughs> one man of God walking in this city. All the city is disturbed. One man of God and all of Chicago is disturbed. Everywhere the minister go, they all ask him, what, what, what is he coming for? Do they do it? One man of God. Everywhere he go, they want to know, uh-huh, who, who, who invited him? What is he doing here? One, you've got to understand that they've taken you away from understanding the source of your strength. The lie undermines the truth. That means that they have caused you to accept those that are not messengers of God to be messengers of God and those that are, you are to outcast them. That's deception. That's deception. We don't get no audiences. <laughs> you know what I mean? That it's hard for fair play. Oh, no. It don't work like that. Why? Because the people have been taught that our message, we're, we're leaders of cults. I mean, they, they're taking you out of mainstream America. Mainstream America is the problem. That's the problem with our people. Someone needs to take them out of mainstream America. I'm approaching the, my subject for today. Y'all bear with me. <laughs> I was merely prefacing it with those little remarks, but I'm going to get to the core of this in a moment. But well, I know I'm looking off to my left over there, and I saw... A face that I hadn't, I haven't seen in 26 years. Looks like my biological sister over there. You know that. Uh, stand up. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> and my eyes looking over there, but <laughs> look one time and I saw something that resembled a little bit. <laughs> oh, thank God that it's blessed you to come out today and to and give inspiration to these words. But we're talking about deception. The war of men of God is against deception. All of the world is rotating on the axis of that lie. They've been tricked. So now we sound strange. 
I mean, the messengers of God now, we sound strange to the people because they've been taught now to accept a lie. So strength came. Continue on. And what else? And the kingdom of our God. And what else? And the kingdom of our God. That means that deception was preventing the coming of the kingdom of God. So if you want the kingdom of God to come, it is simply that you must do what? Cast down deception. Deception is preventing you from living. Deception is destroying you. It says, and the kingdom of our God. All of these things came after deception was cast down. Cast down. So we're trying to perform brain surgery. We're trying to make you cast down deception. But I know it's dressed up today. I mean, it looks a certain kind of way. It's glittering. You know, and it's hard for you to let go. But you've got to understand that as long as you hold on to it, you're destroying yourselves. As long as you hold on to that lie, you are meeting self-destruction. No way, no compromise. It's an absolute statement. Until you let it go, you can't live. So, brothers and sisters, it's time now. We can't afford to make the mistakes of the 60s and the 90s. It is time now. It is either you fight spiritually or you perish. It's just that simple. Either you fight or you perish. No middle ground. Either there is a God in heaven or the black world can forget it. No practical way that they're going to get out of this predicament that they're in. No practical way. So they have to convince you you can't find your strength in God because there's no other way for you to escape his clutches except that there is a God. You better hope there is a God. <laughs> And because if it isn't, go on and get you a job and try to get you some money. <laughs> and because he believes that there is a God, he has to divert your attention away from finding and making reconciliation with your God. He has to keep you in constant conflict with your God. That's the objective of Satan, to keep the people in conflict with God. Now, what is it that we must understand? I want to go to the book of Exodus, the fourth chapter, because Moses gives us a key. Just about everyone that I've spoken with since I've been here and I've inquired as to the roots of our problems and at least 99% of the individuals have replied that the problems are spiritual. Our problems are spiritual. But I don't feel that they had a good understanding of what they were saying, but they had an inkling, a superficial understanding. Our problems are spiritual. Either that or they did not want to touch upon that in depth. But if our problems are spiritual, what they're saying is that God is involved in this. And if God is involved in this problem, what is it? Is God on our side? Is he against us? If the problem is spiritual, that means that somewhere in this problem, in this confrontation, God is involved. Our problems, the roots of our problems are spiritual. And if that be the case, is God on our side or is God against us? Spiritual problems. And they're right, because our problems are spiritual.
but they don't know how to relate to it in depth. They don't understand how God is involved in this. So they just simply say that the problems are spiritual. We go to Moses in the book of Exodus verses 22 and 23. And we find a key. When Moses was being sent into the land of Egypt to deliver our people. You see, our people have been engaging the adversarial forces in a political struggle. A political, economic, social struggle. Use politics to attain the economics to better a social condition. But they can't win a political struggle. They haven't won the political struggle. But we find a key in the book of Exodus as to what kind of struggle that we have to engage the adversarial forces in. Read, please. Reading from the book of Exodus, the fourth chapter, 22nd verse. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord. And Moses, God told Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto Pharaoh. What did he tell him to say? Uh huh. Israel is my son. Says that these people are God's chosen. Uh huh. Even my firstborn. Even my firstborn. Uh huh. And I say unto thee. He was giving Moses his instructions as to what to say to Pharaoh. Uh huh. Let my son go. Let my son go. Why? That he may serve me. No. He said what? Let the people go that they may serve me, the God of creation. Then told Moses, don't go into Egypt trying to get better jobs for the slaves. He told Moses, go and tell Pharaoh, let the people go to serve me. He said, Moses, involve me in the struggle. And when Moses went and talked to Pharaoh, he said, Pharaoh, let the people go to serve God. Moses then engaged Pharaoh in a redemptive struggle. What? He came to get the people and to take them out unto God. There is a great difference in a political struggle and a redemptive struggle. God told Moses, he said what? He said, Moses, he said, you've got to involve me in this struggle against Pharaoh. He said, Moses, don't go down looking for a better job because then it's the taskmasters. He said, don't go down trying to make the economic situation. We're not naive now about the components. He said, but when you go to confront Moses, he said, you tell Moses that you want to bring the people to me. And then he said, and leave the rest up to me then. He said, tell Pharaoh, let the people go that they may go out and to serve God. And when that was stated, then Pharaoh, Moses involved God in the redemptive struggle. And then after that, we find, did we finish those two verses? No, I will. Continue on. And if thou refuse to let him go. And if thou refuse to let him go, huh? Behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Said now. And tell him that if he won't let the people go to serve the God of creation, he said, then me and Pharaoh got to have it out. He said, he said all, I got, all you got to do, our people, you've got to engage the forces in a redemptive struggle, not a political struggle. You must involve God in the struggle. What? We want our people free that we may serve our God. We want to be free to serve the God of creation. 
We're not talking about moving into neighborhoods. We're talking about moving out of neighborhoods. <laughs> Those were the instructions that God gave Moses when he was sending him in to talk to Pharaoh. He said, tell Pharaoh that you want the people free to serve me. Mm -hmm. Fifth chapter, verses 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Read. And afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh. And they went in and they told Pharaoh. Uh Uh-huh. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Said, Thus saith the God of this people, not the Democrats, not the Republicans. Said, We have come to tell you what the God of this people has sent us to say. Uh huh. And what did it continue on? Let my people go. Let our people go. Uh huh. That they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. That they may hold a feast. Unto God. Uh huh. And Pharaoh said, And what did Pharaoh say? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Now you can see it heating up. He said, Pharaoh said, Who is your God? I got missiles and tanks. I've got stations in the in space. So I can take pictures from the moon. Said, Who is this God that is told you to come to tell me to let the people go. He challenged God. That's what we've got to do. Make him challenge our God. Involve God in the struggle. Pharaoh. (laughs) Our struggle has to be a redemptive struggle to take a people out and back unto God. Not a political struggle. Continue on. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Now you see what happened? He said, I don't know the Lord and neither will I let the African Americans go. But it was a different ball game then. And because we come to get a people to take them unto God, now After that, what happened? God engaged Pharaoh. God then made war through his servants against Pharaoh. The power to the servants depends upon Pharaoh refusing the servants' message to let the people go. After that, God sent Moses and Aaron. He said, now the contest is about to begin. And he said, now let me see, Pharaoh. He said, I sent for him. You said you wasn't going to let him go. He said, now it's me and you. And now we're going to see. Because we say that no man can hold a people in slavery that desire to be free to worship God. No power on this earth. All that you've got to do is to desire to serve God. Put it to the test. But the adversary has caused our people to engage him in a political struggle. You can't win a political struggle. Because the political struggle pits Democrats against Republicans. We're talking about pitting God against Pharaoh. You've got to understand this. You've got to understand that this and then God blessed his servants then. Once the people decide they want to be free to serve God, then leave the rest unto us. All you do, if we be those sent by God, all that you must do, line up behind us and tell us You want to be free to serve God and leave the rest to Moses and Aaron. And see, won't we get you free? (laughs) 
Pharaoh was arrogant. I don't know what you all talking about. I don't know your God. Neither will I let the people go. He hardened his heart. But it was all part of the plan. Because just like then, the God of creation wanted to teach Pharaoh a lesson because Pharaoh is just like that lion. Someone had told him that he was the king of the jungle. Pharaoh had an empire stretching all across North and Central Africa. Nobody could believe that the great armies of Egypt could be defeated. God wanted to teach Pharaoh that there was a God in heaven. And it's the same thing today. God is ready. The people are just not ready. <laughs> God said, let me say it again. I said, the God of creation is ready for Pharaoh. All he wants is the signal from the people, just like then with Pharaoh. You see, Pharaoh today does not feel that he can be brought down. God wants to teach him a lesson. All that he needs is a reason. The people won't give him a reason. And we say, if you give him a reason, watch and see when he drown Pharaoh's armies. So it is spiritual. Our problems involve God, but you do not know how to invoke God into the struggle. Our problem is spiritual. God has not been on our side. It's just that simple. Because deception has prevented you from invoking God into this struggle. Let us go further to the book of Proverbs, the 13th chapter and the 24th verse. Y'all bear with me just a few more moments. There's so much that has to be said, but brothers and sisters, there's so much at stake. It's just got to be said now. Take your time and bear with us. And because time is running out, and it's got to be now. And things that have to be said, they've got to be said. Bear with me. Be patient. And spiritual. Proverbs. 13th chapter and the 24th verse. Read, please. Reading from the book of Proverbs, the 13th chapter, the 24th verse. It reads on this wise. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him early. Now, there's another relative law. He that spareth the rod, he does what? He that spareth his rod hateth his son. None of you all are going to walk around saying that you hate your children. But it doesn't matter. There's a relative law that governs how you feel about your children. Whether you say it or not, if you spare the rod, you hate the children. If you spare the rod, you hate your children. Now, let's go further. They have legislated laws that will not allow you to chastise your children. If you chastise the children, they will come and get you and put you in jail. Now, bear with me. That means that the system has very subtly caused us to hate our children. That's a relative law. The devil is more subtle than all the beasts of the field which God created and made. He's not going to come and tell you, I'm going to make you hate your children. You've got to be wiser than the serpent. What did he do? Laws are on the book now that will not allow you to chastise the children. God said, if you spare the rod, you hate the children. The system then, they have made African Americans hate their children. Look at them in the streets today. Why? 
because it says now, if you chastise him, I don't confuse divine chastisement with child abuse. That's a trick word today. Hey, I'm talking about chastisement. I don't know if there are any elders here in the congregation, but I know Helen remember, but when we were children, first of all, when I was down south, Mama used to go out and make me go out and get a switch. A switch. Make me sit down and she would peel the switch. My God. And when she would finish peeling that switch, your rear ain't never went through nothing like that before. I mean, she would wear me out. Whip me with a switch. Iron cord. Today, if my mama whooped me with a switch, the, I could call on the, on, the, on the phone and have my mama put in jail. I had a little sense left. There were three forms of discipline when I was a child. And to all the elders of the congregation, you bear with me here because you know this to be true. There were three forms of discipline. The first one was simply mama putting her hand on the hip and looking at you. When she put her hand on her hip and it was a certain look. And when you, when you saw that look, you knew not to let it go any further. She would just look at you. Phase two was a resonating voice. Did not tell you to shut up. <laughs> and when she, when you heard that certain volume in her voice, you shut up. Mama knew. And then if that didn't work, God forbid that we got to that third stage. Grandmama would knock you down with her fist. Can I get her amen? <laughs> and if granddaddy came home and found out that grandmama had to knock you down with her fist, get out of town, boy. When we were children, we thought grandmama and granddaddy were the toughest things on this planet. Today, you look at your children, they stare you back in the eye. You don't dare lift up your voices and you better not whoop them because you're going to jail. So we say that the problem is spiritual. You see, the system causes us to be in constant conflict with God. The system causes us to be in constant conflict with God. Why? God has told us that the children need chastising. The system say, I ain't going to let you chastise them. God say, if you don't chastise them, you hate them. He say, I'm going to make you hate your children. What do we do? You see, it's spiritual. The only way is that you've got to free yourself from the system. The system keeps us in opposition to God. Spare the rod. You hate your child. That's a relative law. All of you sisters and brothers, you won't ever use that term about hating your children. But if you spare the rod, the prophets say that you hate the children. No way for you to circumvent it whether you like it or not. You hate the children. Continue on. Did we finish that verse? Spare the rod. So we see then, the system keeps us in opposition to God. Proverbs 29 and 15. Proverbs 29 and 15. Read please. The rod and reproof give wisdom. The rod and what? The rod and reproof. The rod and firm correction. Give what? Give wisdom. Give wisdom. 
So that means relative. Let's turn that around. Without the rod and firm correction, they will end up being what? Ignorant. Look in the streets at our children today, at all the ignorance in the streets. You cannot circumvent the words of the inspired men of God. The rod, and the rod isn't always a whipping. The rod is just firm hand to keep a firm hand on your child and raising your children and reproof, firm correction. That voice that I told you about gives intellect, continue on, and the opposite. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Wait a minute. Read that again. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. But a child, our children today are raising themselves. Now it says, the sister is going to pay. Are the sisters paying today for what has happened to our children? Now, it says that the woman is going to be grieved when children are left to raise themselves. The brother go out to the pool hall. He go down on the corner. But the sisters are being tormented by undisciplined children. You paying the price for it. You that are sitting here, the children, the system made you allow children to raise themselves. They won't allow you to raise the children. And it says that a child left to raise himself, himself grieves the sisters. So then, when the sister is grieved, we got problems in the family. The brother and the sister. I'm trying to paint this picture so that you can see how it works because the devil is very subtle and crafty. So then, it looks innocent. It sounds so nice. Child abuse. Don't discipline the children. Let them raise themselves. Contemporary parents. Children become your friends instead of your children. And they sit down and you are a whole conversations of equality, you know, as if you all are peers. You know, and, and how can children be peers with adults? Your vision is supposed to carry you far down the road in areas that they can't even imagine for them. So, read that again. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Grieves the sisters. All of you all with children, the brothers gone out of the house, and you sisters are paying the price for these undisciplined children. That's what the prophet said would happen. But then, when you suffer, when the brother come back home, problems in the family. Divorce, get out, anger, dissension. All of this started with an innocent piece of legislation. The system keeps you in opposition to God. The problems are spiritual. Why? Because the system is anti-God and the system causes you to be anti-God. So now, what does that mean? When is the last time you saw a demonstration for parents' rights? Let us fall out now for God. Let us have a demonstration saying that we want the rights to discipline our children. We want the right to be obedient to the laws of God. When is the last time you've been partaker of a demonstration like that? Those kinds of demonstrations don't exist. Why? Because all demonstrations have been political demonstrations. But now we must organize redemptive demonstrations, demonstrating our desire to return 
unto the laws, statutes, and commandments of God. The teachers They went further. They won't allow the teachers to discipline the students. There is legislation on the books that forbids teachers to put their hands on children. But the prophets have told us that foolishness abounds in the heart of a child. And foolishness is converted to sin. Foolishness left in the heart of a child turns into sin. So the adversary knowing that the teachers need to discipline the children, he then causes the teachers to leave foolishness in the hearts of the children. And that foolishness, as a result, the streets are full of sin, just like the prophet sin. <laughs> foolishness turns into sin. Now, we want the right for our teachers to be able to chastise and discipline our children again. Put a different spin on it, doesn't it? We want a right. Then, we tell the rulers of this great country, we don't want to violate your constitution. The great constitution that rules this great land here. But your constitution causes us to be in conflict with our God. It says that we don't want to violate your constitution. But your constitution causes us to be in conflict with our God. It is for that reason that we ask you, let us go that we may go out of this land and serve our God in another land. Your constitution. That has to be the reason that we go to the president and tell him to let our people go. We must go to the president and tell him Mr. President, you have a great constitution that governs your great country. But your constitution, Mr. President, keeps us in conflict with the God of our fathers. We desire to discipline our children. We desire for our teachers to have authority over our children. We don't want legislation giving rights to gays, that you've got a great constitution, but that constitution is for the ungodly. We let our people go. Let our people go. We desire to leave this land that we may go out and to serve our God. Mr. President, your constitution keeps us in conflict with our God. For our inspired men of God told us that if we spare the rod, we hate our children. Mr. President, we refuse to hate our children anymore. Mr. President, foolishness abounds in the heart of a child and the instructors must drive that from him. For foolishness left in the heart of a child turns into sin, Mr. President. Mr. President, it is for that reason that we are asking you, let our people go. We desire to leave this land so that we not have to violate your great constitution. And we desire to leave this land. We've got to involve God in this struggle. That's what we've got to tell the President. Mr. President, Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord God, we desire to leave this land that we may go to worship the God of creation. And the God of creation say, now, now let him refuse to let you go. And then, 
He said he will engage Pharaoh in spiritual warfare. And his messengers then will engage Pharaoh on your behalf. All we need is for you to allow us to lead you in a redemptive struggle. And we'll tell Pharaoh, we'll tell Pharaoh, and if he refused to let you go then, it's another ball game, brothers and sisters. It has to be a redemptive struggle. We can no longer allow their constitution to govern us when the constitution causes us to be in conflict with God. We have to make a choice. And before, we must go to Pharaoh and tell him of our desire, just as Moses was given the instructions. We desire to go from this land to serve our God. It has to be a redemptive struggle. Bear with me just a moment more. Stretch yourselves a little bit. It won't be long now. We have allowed the adversary to lead us in the warfare. And he led us well into his kind of a struggle, into a political struggle. But it is time now to turn around. It is time now for us to engage him in the redemptive struggle, a struggle for the redemption of our people. A redemptive struggle to bring a people out to take them back unto God. See the difference in the political struggle? Who benefits? Why should God help you in a political struggle? The Democrats and the Republicans benefit. Where are God's benefits in your political struggle? A redemptive struggle, brothers and sisters. Now, I'm going to touch briefly upon destiny. First, let us go to St. Matthew, the 6th chapter and the 24th verse. All of you sitting here, you've got to realize that every individual in this world, every individual on this planet, they are worshiping either God or Satan. There are only two forces commanding the forces on this planet. Only two chiefs of staff, God and Satan. No middle ground. Everyone that you pass on the streets, everyone sitting here in this sanctuary, they are worshiping either God or Satan. And together with that, it is utterly impossible to worship God and Satan simultaneously. Now, I'm not giving you no room to maneuver. I said it is utterly impossible to worship God and Satan simultaneously. There is no such thing as an agnostic that does not believe in God, that does not worship the devil. Everyone, it is either or. Now when you walk out of here today, you got to take a good look at yourself. And you're going to be trying to make Certain and sure not. Because if you're not, it will make you scared to say that you don't believe. And because if you don't worship God, there is no vacuum and no purgatory, no middle ground. Everyone is worshiping God or the devil. And Yeshua said in the sixth chapter of Matthew, read please, it's the 24th verse. Reading from the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, the 24th verse. And it reads on this wise. No man can serve two masters. Wait a minute. So what? No man can serve two masters. No man can serve two masters. Uh-huh. For either he will 
Either he will hate the one and love the other. Wait a minute, there's that term again. Don't none of y'all like to hear the term hate, you know. All over the world they're saying, oh, those are haters. No, nobody, you know, well, everybody in the streets is talking about they love and all this hell and hate is running rampant. Then it has to be that either they don't know what they're talking about or it is without definition. If somebody say they love me, I want a definition. I want to know what they're talking about. The love is not without definition. Everybody talking about they love you, don't love you. Love is relative. He said, if you love one, you what? You hate the other. Whether you say it or not, there is a relative love that governs you. If you love God, you hate the devil. If you love the devil, you hate God. See, the devil is crafty, though. None of you all are going to ever say that you hate God. How would we ever know? Laws, relative laws, says no man can serve two masters. If you love one, you hate the other. Continue on. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And if he holds to the one he what? He will despise the other. If you don't worship God, you despise God. Now it's getting close to home. All the time, all those people in the street are full of hate. Full of hate. And lying about love. Full of hate. Hate God. No man can serve two masters. Each of you sitting here, either or a double-minded person is unstable in what? All of his ways. So brethren, we've got to engage the adversarial forces in a redemptive struggle. The second portion was about destiny, and I'm going to just give you an overview of destiny. You've heard so many individuals say that, speak about controlling their own destiny. Brothers and sisters, no individual controls his own destiny. Men of God control the destiny. There are only, again, two adversaries, two foes out here. Men of God are sent to take control of the destiny of the people and to guide them on the path of the destiny chosen by God. There are only two destinies. The destiny chose for you by God and the destiny chose for you by Satan. Satan's messengers, whoever formulates your character, they control your destiny. Whoever you put your confidence in to formulate your character, they take control of your destiny. Men of God, are sent to formulate the character of the people, to take control of their destiny, to guide them on the path of the destiny chosen by God. Each of you sitting out there, the man of God controls your destiny because you come for him to formulate, to perform that brain surgery, to formulate that character. Destiny is a predetermined station or place. Predetermined. The reason I say that, you must understand that the things you do today, last week, determine what you're going to meet on the path next week. Let me say that again because you've got to understand this. 
the things that you did last month determine what you're going to meet on the path next month. The character and behavior of yesterday determines what you're going to meet tomorrow. So the adversary that has formulated your character knows what you're going to meet on the path. It is already predetermined by your character. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Have you ever wondered, they know how many of you all are going to cut each other on a Saturday night? They know how many African Americans are going to die over the weekend? How many are going to get heart attacks? How many are going to get colon problems, colonic problems? All these statistics, how do they know? How do they know? They know how long you're going to live. The average African American man is going to live 67 years, the woman 70 years. How do they know? They control your destiny. I don't want nobody knowing how long I'm going to live. Somebody come and tell me how long I'm going to live, wouldn't I get to, how do you know? How are you going to tell me how long I'm going to live? Ain't nobody supposed to know that. But they tell you how, you, how long you're going to live. And check it out and see. The black male and the black female. And it does not even arouse their suspicion. How does somebody know and can come and tell me when I'm going to die? And he ain't did nothing to cause it. I would get suspicious. But you don't get suspicious. You just think he's pressing a computer. He has formulated your character. You are meeting the destiny according to the character he has given you. He knows you because he made you. <laughs> destiny. Now men of God have come to change your destiny. Whomever you have confidence in to formulate your character. He controls your destiny. Because the things that you meet on the path next week and next month are the results of your behavior last week and last month. And it says it is inevitable. You must meet that on the path. You've got to meet it. You've got to reap what you sow. So we come to take control of the destiny of our people, to guide you back on the path of the destiny chosen for you by God. That means simply that you must allow us to formulate your character. And according to your character and your behavior will determine what you're going to meet down the road. Now men of God have come to change your destiny. Whomever you have confidence in to formulate your character, he controls your destiny. Because the things that you meet on the path next week and next month are the results of your behavior last week and last month. And it says it is inevitable. You must meet that on the path. You've got to meet it. You've got to reap what you sow. So we come to take control of the destiny of our people, to guide you back on the path of the destiny chosen for you by God. That means simply that you must allow us to formulate your character. And according to your character and your behavior will determine what you're going to meet down the road.
they used to tell us just continue to go down the road son it's going to get a little bit better but brothers and sisters when you're on the wrong path it's never going to get better further down the road you got to get off that path you got to get back to the beginning you've got to get on the wrong path when you're on the wrong path it's not going to get better that's deception again giving you the impression that it's going to get better so that you won't turn around and get back off of that path. You've got to turn around. It has to be an about face, not heading north to heading northeast. Instead of north, northwest. Because northwest, you still going to meet north. It's just going to take a little longer for you to get there. You've got to turn completely around and head south. You've got to get back off of that path. You chose the wrong path. You've got to stop now and turn around. And when you try to turn around, you're going to meet all of those that you passed on the way telling you, Oh, you're going back there. Or you regressing. The problem is this progress. Hey, you never stop to ask him, we progressing, but where are we going? You're getting deeper and deeper into the pits of hell. And soon, you won't be able to escape. You've got to stop now and turn around. Our struggle is a redemptive struggle. We must tell Pharaoh we desire for the people to be free to serve God now. There has to be demonstrations our desire to keep the commandments of God and we must tell Pharaoh let our people go that we not have to violate your great constitution but your constitution causes us to be in conflict with our God and Pharaoh we made a choice now come to ask you but we can't find ourselves in continuous conflict with our God now we got to make a choice now. Pharaoh, let our people go. And then if he does not let you go when we come to get you to take you back unto God, then the contest begins. Brothers and sisters, you've been very patient with me today. And I'm so thankful for the time that I've been allowed to spend with you. And usually what always happens is that I don't get finished with what I have, have to say and then what happens is that I kind of, that invitation that I get, it kind of, whoever invites me, it kind of boxes them in with having to invite me back again. And so, and it's done happened again. You know, minister, I gotta, I didn't get through with everything and I got everybody all aroused up now, you know, wondering what the end of this is going to be, but you won't know if you don't invite me back and if you don't come.